Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is DDR5 server memory. Today, I'm gonna to explain why this is a huge upgrade, much bigger than most folks realize. It's not just a simple DDR4 to DDR5 upgrade. There are new components, new features and functionality that are in this DIMMs that were not in the previous generation DDR4 DIMMs. There are so many new things in this generation that nobody talks about and I really wanna get into that. One good example of that is like, this is a 32 gig DDR5 UDIM, so non-registered, just an unbuffered DIM, which is ECC for like, you know, workstations and stuff like that. And this is very different than the previous generation DDR4 UDIM because uh, you can't actually use this in a server workstation like this Genoa platform behind me. Now there is a good reason for that, but it's so new that a lot of people don't even know that that's a thing. So in this video, what I wanna do is get into DDR5 and the why of DDR5, why it's important. So I'm gonna show you all of the like, you know, bandwidth over time and all those kind of charts as well. We're gonna talk about some of the physical differences, some of the new components that are on these DIMMs, some of the new just kind of features of them. And then I also wanna show you a little bit about why you need them in terms of performance once we've kind of built that story. Now this is gonna be a pretty long video, so we are gonna have chapter markers. If you need them to navigate, feel free to go do that in the description. I also just wanna point out real quick that we are gonna say that Micron is sponsoring this video because I needed more DDR5, frankly, and Micron stepped up, said, yeah, we'll totally sponsor video. They sent 24, 32 gig RDIMs, so that way I would be able to kind of show you that. However, I did go and buy some of these DIMs. Like for example, we have the DDR4 version, which we pulled from the data center. And also uh, this is a ECCU DIM that we're gonna be using in an upcoming project that uh, I decided just to get a Micron Micron one since they are helping out with this video. But of course, like everything on STH, Micron never got to review a script or got to review this before it's going live. They're gonna be seeing it the first time uh, pretty much when you're seeing it as well. Okay, so let's start getting into some of the differences between DDR5 and DDR4. The first one I wanna talk about is just the differences in the DIMMs themselves. And one of the most basic things that you need for a DIMM to actually work is power, right? The new DDR5 DIMMs run at 1.1 volts. If you looked at the previous generation DDR4, you'd typically see 1.2 volts. But that's uh, that's only part of the equation because it turns out that the DDR5 R DIMMs run at an input voltage of 12 volts, whereas the consumer platforms run at five volts. And one of the other big changes that a lot of folks are talking about in the industry, and I can show you here, is that the power management has moved from the motherboard onto the DIMM itself to be able to provide more consistent and more reliable power to the module. So if we look at the DDR4 versus DDR5 DIMM, what you'll see is that we have the RCD on both sides. We'll get to what that is in a sec. But if you turn it over onto the other side, you'll see that we don't really have the PMIC on the DDR4 DIMM, but we do have it on the DDR5 DIMM. And if we look at the DDR5 U DIMM versus the R DIMM, what you'll see is that we still have the little PMIX, we still have the power management on here, but on the other side, we don't have the RCD. Okay, and so to demonstrate this real quick, this is a new ASRock rack motherboard that is for the AMD Epic Genoa. I don't really know that you probably have seen one of these before. This is one of the first ones that they've made. We're gonna have a review of it on the STH main site pretty soon, but I figured we'll just go use it as a little model because it's pretty easy to show you on here. So in my hand, I have a DDR5 U DIMM and a DDR5 R DIMM, and you'll see from the photos that these things are not the exact same. When you look at these two side by side, the keying is slightly different between them along with some of the other components that are on it. And just to kind of show you what that means when it comes to the motherboard, this is a Genoa platform, so it accepts RDIMs. So if we go try putting the RDIM into this and we put it the right way, you'll see that it just pops in no problem. Now, if we try the UDIM on this, well, we try it this way, it's not keyed properly. If we try it this way, it's also not keyed properly. And one of the big reasons for this is just the fact that DDR5 UDIMs are no longer pin compatible with RDIM slots. And the part of that is really just the fact that the motherboard is not managing the power anymore. Instead, the power management is on the DIMs and the client DIMs have a different input voltage than the server DIMs. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about on DDR5 is really the channel situation. With DDR4 servers, you would typically say that, you know, say a AMD Epic Milan would have eight memory channels, but you could do two DIMMs per channel, which means that you could put a total of 16 DIMMs per socket. On the Ice Lake server, you would say the same thing. But on the DDR5 servers, it's a little bit different. The reason for that is that the DDR4 DIMMs were 72-bit DIMMs. The new DDR5 DIMMs are really kind of like 80-bit DIMMs. And what I mean by that is that the 72 bits of the DDR4 generation was 64 data bits plus eight ECC bits. But DDR5 is a little 
little bit different. Instead of a single 64-bit data path, we actually have two 32-bit channels. Now, they're actually 40-bit channels because you have 32 data bits plus eight bits for ECC on each channel. So a DDR4 DIMM is one channel and a DDR5 DIMM is two channels. DDR5 just has an additional eight bits that are there for the second channel's ECC. Now you might ask, why in the heck would they do this? Well, one of the other changes was changing the burst length on those DDR5 channels. And what that allows you to do is actually fill cache lines kind of independently and actually do more parallel work on a single DIMM. And if you're wondering, the way they split it up on modules is like one channel is on one side versus one channel being on the other side. And the reason we care about all these new burst lengths as well as the two channels is that each channel is able to go and fill cache lines independently. And what that means is you do more things in parallel and therefore you get higher effective memory bandwidth versus theoretical bandwidth, right? Okay, so let's talk about something else, which is what are the big chips on these DDR5 RDIMs? Now, the RCDs that you're probably gonna see, at least in this generation, are gonna be made from most likely one of two companies, either Rambus or Montage Technologies. These just happen to be Rambus um, chips. So these are Rambus RCDs here. And what the purpose of the RCD is, is to make sure that all of the DRAM packages and the, and the DIMs are actually running on the proper clocks, right? And so that's really what that is. And these RCDs are the chips that you would find on a RDIM that you don't necessarily see on an unbuffered ECC DIM. Now flipping the DIMs over, what you'll see is that you have the PMIX on the DDR5 DIMs. You don't really have those on the DDR4 DIMs. And that's part of the difference of just that power delivery that we talked about earlier. There's also a SPD hub that's a lot more robust than anything that we've seen before because now there are little tiny things that we have on here, such as we now have two additional temperature sensors. So we don't just have one, we have now have three temperature sensors on a DDR5 DIM versus the one that we would have on a DDR5 DDR4 DIM. The last thing that I really wanted to talk about is on-chip ECC with DDR5. This is a topic that um, has a lot of pretty interesting things there. Like people are saying that like, oh, my desktop memory has all the same ECC as like a server memory uh, RDIM. That's absolutely not true, right? And I just want to show you um, a couple things here, right? Which is the uh, ECC UDIM, which you can see that you have the extra ECC chips. And so that is what this is. The ECC on DDR5 that you get standard is really the on-chip ECC. And the reason for that, um, you know, the, the memory makers and all the memory vendors, all these folks are always saying like, oh, it's like the best feature. It's super important because, you know, makes your memory more reliable, which it does. But the flip side that they don't really talk about too much is the fact that one of the reasons they need to do this is because as they go and push DDR4 or DDR5 clocks, faster and also you try to shrink your memory to make manufacturing better. That's one of those ones where just frankly, you run into the challenge of just reliability over time. And in many ways, the SSD side is really similar to this. As we've gotten like kind of better process technology on our NAND, we've had the challenge of, you know, how do you make sure that you're getting the right data off the, the NAND? And so there has been more ECC and stuff that has gone in. So if you look at like an early gen SSD versus today, there's a ton more ECC that's going on. And the reason for that is really just to make sure that as you shrink the process and make faster SSDs that you're not running into errors. On the DRAM side, it's pretty actually similar conceptually to what's trying to, what they're trying to do here. And I just kind of think that that's, um, that that's one level of ECC. And so doing a little build up here on the ECC UDIM, what you'll see is that we have five packages on each side because of course we need our two channels and we also need our data paths to be now, you know, have that extra ECC, right? So we now have 10 chips on either side versus on the desktop side, you would expect to see eight. And then on the ECC RDIM, you add the RCD and you add the kind of more end-to-end -end data protection that you would expect to see on a server platform, right? And more RAS features and all that kind of stuff. So while a lot of folks are out there saying that like, oh, my DDR5 desktop memory has ECC support. If you're seeing that they have like four chips on a side or something like that, then that most likely means that they have just kind of the on chip ECC. They're not kind of running like on module ECC or like kind of trying to protect more of the data path than just that on chip. It's just kind of a fun little thing that you can see when you have DIMMs like these. What I really want to do is just kind of set the stage for why we need DDR5 server memory. So first off, let's take a look at what happens if we just chart the DDR performance, really bandwidth over time. So go all the way back from the early days of DDR to DDR5 and you see that we have an absolutely massive jump in performance. Now from the DDR4 3200 to DDR5, 4,800, you can see that you get a massive jump in bandwidth. And that's really what happened with the latest generation of servers from both AMD and Intel. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna really focus on that last 10 years or so. So really the end of the DDR3 generation up until the new DDR5 generation. And what you'll see is that over that time, you've gotten about a 2.6X improvement in bandwidth 
over just that 10 years. That's pretty darn good. But on the flip side, when you look at the core count growth over time, the core count growth is absolutely going crazy right now. We started this chart and we had like 12 cores per CPU. Now we're at 96 and we'll be at 128 later in 2023. That's an absolutely massive jump and way more than 2.6X. So the way that server designers work is they say, okay, well, you know, we can get some performance increase from faster DDR memory. And that's totally something that's happened over generations. But the other thing they look to is adding DDR memory channels. And so what you'll see is that the latest generations of CPUs have gone from where we started like four channel memory at the beginning of our chart, all the way up to now we're at 12 channels. So faster memory, more channels, more bandwidth. That's always a good thing. And when we do the simple math, just to take the amount of available bandwidth in a platform over the number of CPU cores, you can see that Intel has actually remained fairly steady over time and AMD has varied a little bit more, but it's still all within this kind of general range that we can put on a nice little chart like this. So if we're bounded by this range because we have faster memory modules and also more memory bandwidth, you might be wondering why you always hear folks talk about, hey, we need more memory bandwidth or our cores are constrained or whatever. And the reason people say that is because cores are much faster than they used to be a decade ago, right? The average core performance, we're just showing a couple of years here from like 2016 to you know the end of 2022. And just in that time, we've gotten over a 2X. And so we're probably talking about closer to like a two and a half to three X over this, just on the integer side. And even more than that, if you're to go look at the performance on the floating point side. So what that means is that on a per core basis, even though the memory bandwidth looks like it's fairly similar on a performance basis, we're not getting the same memory bandwidth per flop or something like that. And I'm just gonna note really quickly here that the CPUs are not the only things that are using memory bandwidth these days. You also need to support more PCIe lanes and faster PCIe Gen 5 devices. And that's also putting a burden on the memory subsystem. So overall, the big lesson here is that we need DDR5 in servers. And so I figured, why don't we go take a look at some of the modules and learn what's different in this generation because the DDR5 folks have really done a lot to help alleviate these bottlenecks. Okay, let's talk about performance because that's one of the big reasons for DDR5. Now, one of the things that we do on STH is we test a ton of servers. And so we need a benchmark suite. Something that we see with our benchmarks is that oftentimes we pick benchmarks, frankly, that scale with IPC. So the amount of instructions per clock that a CPU can do, also the clock speed, and then the number of cores. So what we did was, uh, you know, it was kind of hard to actually show the memory bandwidth changes in a lot of things, especially because a DDR5 platform would be either Sapphire Rapids or Genoa, and a DDR4 platform would be like Ice Lake, Milan, or Rome. So it was a challenge just because we can't use DDR4 in a DDR5 platform. So what we did instead was we said, okay, well, let's see if we have any workloads that we've used on STH that maybe we haven't even published, but just kind of that we saw this kind of memory scaling issue because we run into it every once in a while. And one really good one where we had some data was we looked at a workload that we looked at Rome to Milan. So that is really a clock speed and an IPC increase. And then we also looked at the impact of Genoa. So what you'll see here is that there's definitely a performance improvement between the Rome generation to the Milan generation, but both end up running into a wall before you hit 64 cores and they're just not able to continue scaling. On the flip side, we also have Genoa, which again is an IPC and a clock speed improvement. So you see a uplift from that in the earlier part of the range. But then when the other chips that are using DDR4 run out of memory bandwidth, you see that Genoa with the 12 channels of DDR5, so 50% more channels plus 50% faster DDR5 versus DDR4, you see that that memory bandwidth allows you to carry through and actually utilize the additional cores on the chip. Now, there are, of course, many workloads that are not completely memory bandwidth limited, but on the flip side, this, I think, shows one of the key reasons that the DDR5 transition was very important. And another data point for you, is if you look at the top 500 supercomputers in the world, you'll see that the new systems that are being added to the list every six months or so, they're not necessarily using the maximum core count SKUs that are out there. Instead, they're actually using much lower core count SKUs, like say 32 cores instead of 64. And the reason for that is really just that they're memory bandwidth limited. So getting higher frequency and fewer cores and having the memory bandwidth spread among fewer cores doesn't run out, you know, you don't run into that cliff that you saw on our benchmark, right? So that's really the reason that a lot of these top 500 systems are still using lower core count parts, even though raw performance wise, you could get more flops from having more cores. So that's an example of what we saw and also a good example of what people that are very smart with PhDs in the industry actually do because they 
run into this memory bandwidth challenge all the time. That is why DDR5 is so exciting. Okay, and let's look a little bit to the future to later in 2023, and let's talk about CXL. This is an Astera Labs Leo platform, which is a CXL type three device. What that practically means is that you can take this, which looks like a PCIe, you know, by 16 connector here, right? You can take this card, you can add it into a server like this and add more memory, assuming all the firmware and stuff supports it. So I'll show you a picture over here of what this looks like when you take the cover off, but you can see that we have four DDR5 DIMMs. Now putting four DDR5 DIMMs with this Leo controller on the card allows you to use the vast majority of the by 16 connector bandwidth and it gives you about the same memory throughput as two DDR5, I think like 4,800 or so channels. The latency, by the way, is about the same as if you were a CPU trying to access the remote sockets memory. That's about the same latency as going to one of these cards. Now, this world is uh, rapidly changing. There are so many so many things changing, uh, both on the server side and also the firmware side and all this stuff. So I just want to point out the fact that, um, you know, th this is something that we are going to have on the STH site. I'm just kind of waiting for it to stabilize a little bit more before we show everyone. But I, I'm, I do want to show off these because I think there's a really important piece of technology because it allows you to add more memory bandwidth to a system without adding more memory channels. Okay, so what the heck did we just do? I think we just made probably the best resource on server DDR5 that's out there. I mean, if you think about what we did, we covered in this video, the DDR5 transition and why we need DDR5 from a server standpoint. And we just need that memory bandwidth that DDR5 provides. It's a huge performance boost. We talked a little bit about how the DIMMs are made and why they're different. We talked about the ECC U DIMMs versus R DIMMs and the differences between the DDR5 generation and the DDR4 generation. We also went into what are the new components and the new little bits and features that you see on the new DIMMs. We talked a little bit about the performance of the new DDR5 modules and why that's important to be able to utilize your cores. We also talked about some proof points at the top 500. We talked about the future with DDR5 powered CXL type three devices that you'll probably see in the market later in 2023. And I even gave you a cheat sheet on why you need DDR5 memory because uh, well, frankly, if you wanna use new Genoa or Sapphire Rapids or newer servers, you're gonna have to use DDR5. That is an absolute ton to cover in a single video. If you did like this video, definitely share it with your friends and colleagues because this, uh, this took a long time to make. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.